So we're going to uh, to kind of go in a circle and introduce ourselves. But before we do that, I'd like to take a moment uh, to talk about two things um, to kind of tie into our acknowledgement. The first is to remember and honor Colton Bushi, who was the, ind the young indigenous man who was shot and killed in Battleford um, in 2016 and who, whose killer was acquitted um, on Friday. I think it's really important if we're talking about doing the work of justice in the context of this land to see how injustice manifests, particularly towards Black and Indigenous communities. Um, secondly, I would like to take a moment to remind those of us who are here today that uh, tomorrow, Thursday, is the emergency deportation hearing for Abdul Abdi, who is the uh, young uh, Black man who was um, came to Canada as a refugee, as a toddler, and has was in state custody for most of his life. And since no one bothered to apply for Canadian citizenship for him, he's now at risk of being deported to Somalia. And I think when we talk about young people and anti-Black racism, that's a, a clear case where we can see the manifestations of a system of barriers uh, that really brutalized and became quite violent towards Abdul throughout his life. Um, so for those of you who have the capacity to advocate um, and to support Abdul, you can actually, if you if you are uh, follow me on Twitter, or if you go to my Twitter page, there's some instructions about some actionable things that you can do to support him. Um, so uh, as Katie said, my name is Rania al -Mujammer. I am an artist and inclusion, anti-oppression, liberation consultant working contemporary art institutions, racialized health, <coughs> communities, and the law, and STEM. Um, and I'm going to hand it off. Uh, do you want to start, Gillette? Sure, I'm Gillette Allen, and as my title says, I'm currently the program director at Delta Family Resource Center. Mm -hmm. I've been working in the social service sector for over 20 years. A lot of my work has been around um, working with youth, in particular um, black youth. I've done a lot of work around poverty, a lot of work around um, anti-oppression. And um, currently in my own life, I'm doing a lot of work um, with young people that are currently in the child welfare system and um, I'll do some consulting on anti-oppression work and racism. Thank you, Trevon. Hi everyone, my name is Trevon. Um, my background is in child and youth care. Right now I'm a provincial youth design development associate here at Youth Rex University. Um, my practice varies very widely. Um, I've done practice at residential centers, um, educational centers being the schools, youth homeless shelters. I'm currently also involved in numerous research projects analyzing Black youth leading care and the child welfare system. Thank you. Kofi? Well, hi, everyone. My name is Kofi Hope. I'm the executive director for the CEE Center for Young Black Professionals, and that stands for CEE is Careers Education Empowerment, and that's what we do. In essence, we provide comprehensive wraparound supports and life supports to young people who are kind of farthest from the labor market. So they've been in conflict with the law or have precarious housing, et cetera. I've uh, been doing this work for a long time, along with having done some academic work where I was looking at North-South solidarity, specifically around the liberation movement in Southern Africa and Canadians' involvements in it and how the nonprofit space interacted with different political struggles. And I sit on the board of directors for the Toronto Environmental Alliance and the Atkinson Foundation. Thank you so much for that. Um, so I wanted to uh, invite folks throughout the session. If you have questions, please do send them in through your chat function. Um, if you send in a question, I might not ask it right away because uh, as a facilitator, it might make more sense to ask it in a different point of the conversation, okay? So for us, we're just gonna start off with a little bit of context around anti-Black racism. So kind of a general definition is that it's a form of racism that particularly targets Black, African, and Afro-diasporic peoples. This term identifies the ways in that social racism and systemic racism particularly targets and harms Black communities and individuals. Um, Anti-Black racism has internalized, interpersonal, and institutional manifestations. All racism is rooted in anti-Blackness um, in the context of this land. All racism is also rooted in colonialism and anti-Indigenous racism. Um, particularly, uh, anti-Blackness is a currency that everybody trades in. It's the most accessible currency of white supremacy. 
So understanding it as such means that we have to address anti-Black racism specifically, rather than having large, broad, overarching conversations about racism in general. So I'm going to get into the questions. Uh, the time you'll notice will be like flying by. So if we don't get through everything, feel free to tweet at me and I'll do my best to come back at you with resources or connect you with individuals who might be able to answer your questions. So the first question that I'm going to ask folks is, why is it important to examine anti-Black racism through an intersectional lens? Is anybody feeling brave enough to go for it? Um, so just speaking to myself um, as a Black male, I understand that the Black culture within itself is very complex. And um, as a Black person, I'm not just Black. I can be Jamaican. I can be from a continent within Africa. So being Black is very diverse within itself. So um Intersectionality as a tool allows us to see how intersecting identities may allow for further marginalization or kind of a separate identity within itself, right? So when we just look at Black as an overarching theory, we kind of um, muddle what being Black really is. And using intersectionality allows us to see specificities that may target certain groups and disproportionately or disparately impact certain groups. I think it's also important that we look at intersectionality because, as Trayvon says, we all come with different identity and that black is, it's, it's, it's very complex when we say that we're black, right? I mean, I can, I'm black, I'm a woman, I could be disabled and, you know, the disability might not be visible. I could belong to the LGBT community. And so you just can't just use that one term to, to paint us all because we all come with different identities, with different needs. And if we don't look at intersectionality, then we don't meet um, people's needs or meet them where they're at. Um, you know, for example, you know, you know, black folks belonging to the LGBT community often get overlooked, often get um, left out of conversations. And so it's really important that we look at our intersecting identities and how we're gonna work with people and how best we can serve them. And so in working with young people, you know, it's very important for them to understand that they come with multiple um, identities and that the best way for them to get services that service providers understand this and see this. Yeah, I think, you know, we need to acknowledge that there's been a historical lens for approaching the kind of black struggle in North America that's perceived the struggle mainly through the lens of the male straight Christian black experience. And so many stories get lost, but that is kind of our default when we look to the civil rights movement and these other struggles. That's what many people hold in their minds when they think about Black identity, but also experiences of anti-Black racism. And so it's critical to take an intersectional approach so we can look at these different aspects and also realize two things. One, that oppressions can exist within our own community. Yes. <clears throat> we can think of homophobia or transphobia or ableism or the different uh, discrimination people can face within the black community that we also need to acknowledge as we're fighting, you know, the societal structures around us. We also have to do that self-work internally about the oppressions that manifest within our communities. Shadism being another one that's, you know, top of mind to think about. Um, and also that has a real impact as far as programming goes. You know, many of the black focus programs that have existed historically have taken a, an African not against, but many times has come from a lens of kind of grounding Africanness in West African culture and West African identity. And I know when we were starting C, we did focus groups with 100 Black youth across the city. And one of the things that was clear was people said, we don't want to, we want programs that are based around Blackness. We don't want to go somewhere where someone is preaching to us about what it means to be Black because there are Black communities in Toronto versus one community. And within that, for some folks, their understanding of their Blackness might be rooted, you know, if you're East African, it may be rooted in your you know, ethnic identity. For some people, it's within their Somali identity or within Islam was a big part of their Black identity. For folks in Southern Africa, it can be other points that you're looking to from Afro-Latino, there's language, et cetera. And so I think it's really important I think we've lost. Yeah, I think we've lost. Uh, black, and if there. you don't fit into oh, and there's something wrong with you, or you're an you're an other, versus embracing all of those different black identities in one safe space. 
Thank and you so much. Yeah, go ahead, Gillette. Oh, sorry, and I was gonna say, I think a piece of that is just really important because, you know, lately that I've been working with a lot of young people, you know, the whole term black just seems so um, confusing to them that mm. I'm not just black. Um, and so what Kofi's saying that with, with all these different identities and these different things that can make you a black person, I think it's so critical for our young people to understand that there's, all, there's a lot of this differentness because what happens is when they face um, anti-black racism, you know, those daily microaggressions, I think once they have an understanding of the intersectionality, I think they can best then address some of those issues that are coming at them. So I think that's, that's really key, you know, as we move forward and work with young people um, in our communities. Because I think there's, a, there's been a lot of confusion around, you know, as I was saying earlier in our conversation, this this whole thing of black versus African like so what am I who am I and and what makes me black and and what makes me different you know so I think really having that conversation within our community and for us to come up with a narrative and not for somebody else to define that narrative for us I think is just really important thank you I think um you know I speaking from my own lived experience as a queer black immigrant Muslim woman living in the inner city. For me, intersectionality is not just a theory or a buzzword, it's a radical practice, right? It is one of the biggest functions of racism is that it reduces entire diverse uh, multitudes of blackness into a monolithic group. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't allow you the, the humanity of being nuanced and full of contradictions and layers and texture and the things that make people people. Um, and I think, you know, the, the best, function of intersectionality is that it allows us to, to think about who's chronically excluded, mm -hmm. okay, who's e excluded even when we're talking about diversity and inclusion and access and equity, who doesn't get a seat at those tables still. Mm -hmm. um, I, and the thing about, you know, when we don't think of, we don't practice intersectionality, we reinforce really harmful power structures by saying this is who matters inside our communities, this is the order in which they matter. Mm -hmm. um, and that there's a hierarchy for liberation. We know that oppressions are interlinked, they amplify and inform each other, So, and that people are not pie charts, we don't have our experiences independent um, based on specific facets of uh, our identities. You know, Some days I wish I had a form when I'm experiencing some kind of oppression. I'm like, could you check off what's going on here? Is it all <laughs> of the above? Because um, I need some clarification around it. Um, and being, you know, I think a black youth know intersectionality whether or not they use those words to describe words. it because they live exactly. it every single day. Yeah. Um, and the, uh, the thing about a lack of intersectional analysis when we're talking about anti-black racism is that it robs us of the opportunity to address issues within our communities that Kofi was talking about. I think that's really critical. When we think of our communities as intersectional, then we can totally address the harm that our communities ex experience large, as a large black community, but also the harm that we produce and recreate inside our communities and our spaces. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like that those are the kind of summary points that I had in terms of that and also that all of our blacknesses are develop are are coming into our blackness and our understanding of our black identities happens in different contexts. So for someone like me who's an East African immigrant, the context of my blackness is constructed against a, largely an Arab world and then I immigrate to Canada and inherit a history of blackness here too. So navigating that and having space to hold, you know, both realities and both lived experiences is really important. I'm wondering if anyone else has thoughts, challenges, disagreements. No, I think you're right. I mean, I mean, myself, I've been immigrated from Jamaica at a very young age. Um, I knew I was black growing up. You know, I knew it was from African heritage, but I think it was just compounding when I came here, and that's, that's all people saw that you are a young black girl, and that became very important. But growing up in the Caribbean, I was more concerned about classism, mm. right? It was more about class, not having those who have and those who don't have, right? But then coming, coming here to Canada, like my race became um, front and center. And so everything that I did and the way that I, that I grew up and all the experiences that I had, race was, race was um, you know, played a major role in that you know, in, 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 um, in forming my identity in, in this place, right? So I think you're, you're, totally, you're totally right about that. Do you have anything to add, Tron? Yeah, um, even myself, so I'm born in Canada, and um, I've always had this thing with education where I've never really understood my experience 
through words. I've only kind of expressed it through feelings, right? I've, I felt this way about school and I felt like I was being treated differently. And I remember having a group of friends and we were pretty diverse in terms of who was part of this group. And I didn't understand why certain things felt like it was only happening to me, right? Even though we were all males and you boys are getting in trouble today, right? Once again, and I felt like certain microaggressions and things were happening specifically to me. And intersectionality are really allowed as a tool, like now in my latter years, to kind of see why certain things may be due to race, certain things may be due to class, certain things may be due to age. And I really feel this is a powerful tool that we need to kind of practice, as you mentioned before, Renee, like practice, because it's a really complex thing that doesn't come overnight with understanding. So the, the ability to practice and just have an awareness of what intersectionality is and when it can be a useful tool is, is very important for our Black community. I think to build on that, there, you know, intersectionality, you know, is a great tool, yes, to look internally. So to help recognize one's own power and privilege that you bring into situations and spaces. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's something for me. I've you know spent many years doing organizing and work within the black community. But as someone with a mixed heritage, one of the important things I grappled with and had some really good folks who, who helped me on that journey when I was doing leadership was talking about shadism, was talking about the privilege I bring from having connections to two different communities and also having connection to the majority culture in Canada and maybe a familiarity or direct link that others didn't have. And without intersectionality, like I think it, black solidarity and pan-Africanism and these concepts are so critical. But if we don't take that intersectional lens, sometimes we miss the way in which we have power and privilege that manifest in different spaces and way in which we silence or exclude other voices and kind of take those things for granted. And so to me, it's as much about a tool we bring to young people and others as it is a tool for critical self-analysis. And I think when we have that, it just makes us better leaders within our own community. Thank you so much for that, Kofi. I, I think I relate to that a lot as uh, when black people are invited to the table, I'm frequently the person who gets the phone call. Um, and I think really like, like really positioning yourself in a way that's really intersectional and understanding that um, lets you be critical even when you are being included in particular spaces and contexts, right? So, I mean, recently I was invited to speak at a panel and I sort of looked at it and I was like, am I really the only black person? You know, why are you always calling me? <laughs> and I, and I mean, uh, yeah, totally. I'll, uh, that's my work and I understand that, but there's a lot of black voices that are not ever getting an invitation to be on a panel, right? Um, and I think that's really important for those who have the, uh, who are participating in this webinar today who have influences, um, programmers and organizers and that kind of thing. It's like, are you always inviting the five black people that you know who do this work? Are, and what Do they look like me, you know? Because I'm, I'm aware of like how my particular phenotype and the way that I look gets me access into spaces that other black people don't get and particularly other black women, trans and queer black people don't get. Um, I, as a queer person who is very straight passing, entering spaces like that is a lot easier for me than it is for someone who maybe they, you know, they perform their gender in a different way. Um, they are out in a different way than I am as a queer person um, or are visibly Muslim. And like me, I'm Muslim, but I'm not visibly Muslim. So having these being really critical is really important because when black youth see themselves reflected uh, in who's doing the work, who's having the conversations, that's really important for quote unquote inclusion. Um, and then also it, it's important from a design place for people, right? Is that it helps you, intersectionality helps you think about who is the most marginalized, you center those people and then you design backwards. Everybody else is included by default when we do that, right? Um, and when people tell me, oh, it's a program for black youth, I'm like, okay, which black youth? <laughs> they look at me, no, people look at me like I'm not, like, they're like what? I'm like, no, really, which black youth? Make me a list. Who? You know? And I think class is one of those key pieces. And when we yes. see in spaces that, yes, you can have black bodies in the space or in leadership roles, but are we having folks who had lived experience in marginalized communities? Yes. Are we having folks who had experience coming as newcomers and having to work their way into the system? Are we just getting Canadian born middle class black folks? There's nothing wrong with that, but are those the voices that are predominating in the space? Are those the voices who become the spokespeople or gatekeepers for community? That's when there's a problematic approach. And, you know, with our program, one of the things we really wanted to think about was the fact that every five, 10 years, there's gun violence in this city that is suddenly becomes part of the national or provincial consciousness. 
people look at it, they say, oh my gosh, this is an issue. Money appears in community, but many times that money never gets to those youth who, need it. who are actually at risk or involved in the violence because of a process of creaming where agencies take the money and say, yes, we're going to serve black youth, but they serve those that are easiest to serve. They serve the keeners, those who are already connected to leadership programs, those who might be from you know, a different class background, etc., and the youth that, you know, our hardest to serve we might be living you know in precarious housing have a tattoo on their neck may have had a conflict with the law you know all those pieces they tend to never get access to the money or the resources because they're the more difficult ones to serve so when we built c that was a core value wow. to say we actually want to seek out the most marginalized and we want to purposefully build programming for them because they're the ones as a young person said in jane finch it was kind of our blood money that led to this funding and yet we don't see any of it. And that's an injustice. And you can't solve it if you don't take an intersectional approach. I'm glad that Kofi is raising that point. Because now that we have the Ontario Black Youth Action Plan and all that money from the province that's currently being divvied out, you know, to serve Black youth. And that's one of the things that I've reflected on. Who's being served? Are the Black youth who are the most marginalized in the city being served? Or are we doing the same old, same old and getting to those who are just easy? That's just, just going to make our life easy, make our jobs easy. So I'm really glad that, um, that Kofi raised that point. And I'm hoping that um, with these dollars that's coming out from the Ontario Black Youth Action Plan, that it really does get down to those young people that are most marginalized. The ones that are, you know, exiting out of the child welfare system, the ones that are in child welfare system, the ones who are living in precarious housing, the ones who are underemployed are the hardest to be employed. I'm hoping that, you know, and some of the programming, you know, that they're giving money for, some of it doesn't even make sense. Like, you know, so again, when we're thinking about programming, as I was saying earlier to Trayvon, my evaluator, um, have young people evaluate some of these things that we're talking about. Were they at the table when you decided that this was something that they needed, you know? So I think it's really important that, that we raise that issue and, and intersection um, really is key to that conversation. And I think as a practical point for a lot of um, maybe frontline practitioners, managerial practitioners, it's important for us to be aware of what's happening around our social context in Ontario. So being aware of this amount of money that's being held up here and it's being dispersed as such and paying a keen ear to programs that are receiving these monies because this directly impacts our work. So as practitioner or as, as advocates, we need to be aware of what's happening so that way we can best serve our young people to our fullest capacity. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I think I'm going to kind of ch uh, change directions and we're going to circle back around to some of the strategy and practices pieces. Um, I'd like for us to have a little bit more context before we dive right into it. Thank you so much for your insights. You'll notice that I'm taking notes too. I always love when I get to be in conversation with people that I'm taking something away and learning. I always do often. Um, so the question that I'm going to go to next is, why is it important to collect demographic-based data and particularly race-based data that uses black as a category for, for that research? Yeah. Uh, okay, my screen highlight is, I think it's me. Okay, so um, <laughs> race-based data. Um, I'll never forget in one of my classes, I've heard one of, my, one of my friends, actually one of my friends, say, I'm not too sure why everything is being focused to black people. I, I know there's a lot going on in the community, but why is it focusing on black people? And um, I sat there with it. I really didn't have a solid answer at the time. So I had to really start to do my homework and, and understand that in order to kind of solve something, we need to have a laser point focus on things that are happening within that community. So when we look at places like, or systems such as the child welfare system, CS Toronto, for example, that has an overrepresentation of, of black youth, right? About 41% of youth in child's and children age sites of Toronto is, is black, right? If, if we don't have this race specific data, we're not understanding specific disparities and proportionalities that are impacting certain groups. And to add back to that point of intersectionality, right? When we look at the child welfare system and we have young people that are identifying with the LGBT community, right? And, and we're noticing that, hey, when they're involved with child welfare and they're identifying with this group, they actually end up homeless at an extremely scary rate. Right. Mm -hmm. So race based data allows for us to really put that laser focus in and allow for strategic and intentional programming to support that demographic. Thank you. 
Well, um, I've been very much involved with the city's process um, with the anti-black racism um, work that's been happening. And I did um, did some work with a panel of experts who, who do um, data collection. And, you know, one of the things that we identify that it's, you know, as Trayvon was saying, that it's really important for us to have this data. Because all too often, you know, when we try to look at the black community and, and just to see some of the disproportionality that's happening, um, we always have to go to U.S. Um, data. Um, it's high time for us. The black community here in Canada is large enough. We've been here for a long time. Um, certain issues have been affecting us and impacting our community with very poor outcomes. And I think it's high time for us to have the data to show how, how this is happening. And again, once we have the data, then we can start looking at how to resolve some of these, some of these issues. Thank you. Kofi, can you hear us? Do you have anything to add, Kofi? He's hearing. Yeah, I, I think we've lost him there for a moment. Okay, so I'm gonna circle back to Kofi in a moment, um, and I'm gonna make some points that I think um, kind of feed off of what both uh, Teron and Gillette were saying, which is the fact that when we collect data, this demographic-based data, I really encourage the collection of intersectional data. Um, again, that is how we practice intersectionality as a radical practice and rather than a theory um, that lets us understand who's in the margins of the margins. Um, also, both quantitative and qualitative data. Um, I think often we tend to focus on the numbers side of things. And as, as much as that's really good at showing us large trends, we want to see how they manifest in really complicated ways. Second, um, uh, there's often a conversation around why do we collect data that's specific to black as a category? Um, and the reason for that is whenever we collect data that's under people of color that includes black people, and then we go back and we collect data that separates black and people of color into separate groups, you see there's a massive disparity. So we know that racism and anti-blackness particularly targets black communities in ways that make us you know, live precarious and vulnerable lives. So to get a really good understanding of that, we need to do that this way. And also it leaves from like a personal place, when you have the data, it leaves you not fighting with people about proving your lived experience. Yes. That's an exhausting place that youth have to, youth are the resident experts on their lives. However, they are not treated as such. And the result of that is they are constantly being um, faced with people who have privileges that they don't, and then having to prove to those people that one, you have a privilege that I don't have, two, my lived experience is real, three, my pain and my suffering and my exclusion and the barriers that are faced are valid. Um, and that's a whole lot to do before you get to school at eight o'clock in the morning, you know? <laughs> so th this is a, really, this is a burden that's on the shoulders of a lot of black youth um, is their believability. Yes. Yeah. So I don't know, Kofi, are you, do you want to speak to? Yeah, I think I'm back with you for now yes. at least. <laughs> um, folks have covered a lot of it, but, you know, and it's interesting because I was in Ottawa on Monday and we were talking to federal cabinet ministers um, and doing some lobby work. And that was the number one demand for every ministry we spoke to was disaggregated race-based data. And specifically the trend you were speaking about, Rania, around this idea of visible minority. You know, one of the recent things, there was a study and some stats released around um, post-secondary edu education. And one of the things you understand about education with our community that's different than say the South Asian community or East Asian community is the fact that rates of educational success and attainment go down each generation black folks have been in Canada. And that moves a different way than for other communities, but it gets lost in the data. But what to me is so important about that and why that's really important for us to understand is we can say, this isn't about people bringing problematic cultures from other parts of the world. This isn't a problem with Somali culture coming to Canada or Jamaican culture coming to Canada or Ghanaian culture coming to Canada. Actually, when people come with those cultural understandings and nuances, they do better in Canada. It is part of the experience of being black in Canada that is leading to some of our systematic oppression. And the longer we're here, the more that tends to become ingrained. And so this is really about what Canadian culture does to us as opposed to what we bring here. And being able to make that argument, you can say it 
anecdotally or academically, but when you actually have the stats, and I was there in the room, when you say it to a cabinet minister and say, we have the data behind it, suddenly they have to take you seriously. Mm -hmm. They have to say, wow, okay, I didn't know that. I didn't realize that. And so it is so critical for us to win, uh, and it is sometimes a fight, win these battles to advocate for the changes we need to have the data um, to back it up. And there's this, you know, accounting term um, that people use that say, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And in many ways, I think that's true, that even for us with best intentions and our analysis from our individual place, it's hard to see the big picture. And it's very easy to waste some of our limited resources and time and intellectual capital on activities that may not be the most successful if we don't have the data to help tell us, you know, are we making progress here? Are these certain types of programming working? Are we seeing graduation rates going up? Are we seeing engagement? You know, are we seeing that amount of youth and care going down? Without the data, we're kind of shooting in the dark. And I think, you know, as someone who's worked on the ground for a long time, I've seen lots of money that hasn't been the best spent. And I think it's a shame every time a dollar for our community doesn't properly go to our community. And so data is one of those tools, not a guarantee, and you need that qualitative data as well about the texture of people's lives. But those quantitative numbers help us to make sure the interventions we're doing are the most effective and targeted in the right place. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Juliet, do you have something to add? Yeah, I was going to say that, but it's, uh, you know, with all that being said, I think it's also important as to who is collecting the data. So that's something that we need to be very mindful as we move forward with um, race-based data collection. Um, that it's those of us, like, it's our community that's collecting that data and controlling that narrative. Because all too often we know researchers come into our community, they get the data, and then they can spin that data to their likeness, right? So I think it's important that, you know, we're the ones in charge of doing that, and so we can control our own narratives um, going forward. <clears throat> Thank Such you. I think that's, that's critical. Right. Yeah, Trevon? Touch on that point. I, I'm loving this conversation. I just feel like overwhelmed with like thoughts and and, and dialogue. But um, historically, research has been utilized to further oppress and marginalize our community, right? And when we hear research on Black youth in general, it typically takes a very negative tone, right? But when we know that being Black is being resilient, it's being strong, and we, we navigate these racist yeah. institutions on a regular basis, right? And um, to touch back to Kofi's point around um, understanding race-based data and systems, when we look at the educational system, for example, and we, and we have an instructor or a teacher that may have a colorblind perspective, and, and they're teaching that within a position of influence and, and, and power, it's, it's, it's scary because now we're, we're having a teacher that can't see me for who I am and, and understand me, right? From, from more so than my aesthetics, right? More so for my story that this is what I've gone through in society historically, and this is where I am right now, right? And um, we look at the child welfare sector, for example, until recently with Bill 89, we didn't know that maybe black girls had exceptional hair and needed some more treatment, right? So that wasn't a part of the daily culture in child welfare, right? We didn't know that certain celebrations needed to be celebrated with certain groups, right? When, when we put a, a black young woman in her home with a white family, there may, nothing, there, may, there may be nothing wrong on the outside, but when we think about the cultural needs of that young black woman, are, are those being thought about, right? And without that race-based data, we wouldn't have understand that, whoa, this demographic is being impacted at a disproportional rate. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think something that's, uh, that both, I think everyone has touched on is the fact that when we have the data, we can, it can inform our programming and amplify our impact, right? If we are going out there and we're making programming for black youth without the context around it, how do we really know that it's needed? How do we know that it's impactful? How do we set hard targets and then measure and evaluate those targets without the data for context? And another thing that I think is like from like a larger cultural place is that it helps us to confront that meanwhile in Canada narrative that really like uh, silences already oppressed people in the context of Canada by being like, well, at least it's not bad as the United States, right? When we start to get race-based data, for example, when CAS started collecting that race-based data, our communities have long known there was a problem. Our communities have long feared their children being disproportionately removed from their family care and placed in state custody in that way. Um, and now there's t tangible quote unquote evidence to have those conversations. Um, and then when you have complementary research, when you have research that looks at family violence in black communities 
relative to other communities and says actually pretty much it's on par with other communities. And then you have data that says that black children are being removed disproportionately from their homes. We can very easily then draw the conclusion that there is anti-black racism at play as opposed to people saying, well, you know, it's because there's a cultural context of abuse in black families. So then we can, when we have research that's happening in a cross-sectoral capacity, we can really make really informed programming and funding decisions. And at the end of the day, make sure that not just two cents of every dollar is actually end up in the black, black community. Um, uh, Kofi's um, example around educational attainment was really critical. Another example that I've been working with in terms of the um, racialized health is looking at maternal health and birth weight of black children. So for mm -hmm. in the States, African American women who are intergenerationally African American, as children had the lowest birth weight. Now, continental African immigrant women, children's birth weight was on par with white children. But their children's children's birth weight dropped. Mm -hmm. So then it showed us that there was a pro that, that it was actually systemic racism that was or is the key factor in making or impacting both maternal and infant health. So being able to have that data can help us really understand uh, the institutionalized nature of that, of anti-blackness and all the different ways in which it impacts the, the physical health, the well-being, the success, the thriving, um, the survival of black people in Canada. So I think for me, those are like some of the larger the larger pieces around that conversation and the reason for that data to be like really co like comprehensive and intersectional is that when people are talking about the educational attainment of black youth that was a conversation that was happening a lot south of the border and then more comprehensive data came out and said actually black women have the highest educational attainment of any group in the united states okay so then obviously there then became a gender lens on a conversation around why is there this disparity and this gap what can we do to target you know, how can we, uh, is what, what role does black girl magic play in that really in the sense that like, what role does the resilience of black women and the ways in which we're socialized in particular ways contribute to our educational attainment? So there's a lot of pieces of the conversation that I think the data can really help provide context. And the data also stops people from having to tell the same stories over and over again. It's a very exhausting and traumatizing to have to parade your pain in all these ways, your suffering on a personal level and your community and then for your children to have to do it and for their children to have to do it, it, it can it feels like defeat in a lot of ways. So I think if we're talking about things like the mental health and the well-being of black youth in our programming, we have to consider how that really informs that. So I'm gonna ask if anybody else has final thoughts to add to the data question before we move on. And I'm also going to invite our participants, please, if you have any questions, feel free to share them. And if you would like further clarification on something as well. I just think to reiterate the point, and I think it's great, and Trevon mentioned it, and Rania, you talked about it with the example around Black women and educational rates, that we really make a conscious effort to seek out data that shows the assets of our community, along with the disparities. Because many times, you know, I've had this conversation with folks working in the city and in the civil service, who've said, if you guys always lead with disparities, yes, it may help you in the short term to get that funding, but in the long term, it reinforces the stereotypical views on our community that, you know, actually harm us down the road. And so how do we, and that's why, and that's one of the, you know, ways in which anti-Black racism puts us in a box, right? Where we have to prove our struggle and pain in order to move forward our agenda. But at the same time, we have to try to find ways to fight the stereotypes and uh, so-called truths that anti-black racism has about black underachievement, black incompetence, black deprivation. And so I think we have to make a conscious effort as those of us who are knowledge creators to balance the ones that talk about gaps with ones that show where we're succeeding and where we're doing better than the norm. Yeah, I, that's so important for model setting and for practices too. So what's worked is getting to celebrate, the, the celebratory things are really important too because they're they're showing us what our communities are doing and what maybe potentially service providers are doing to support our community's efforts to do something that has worked so that we can learn from not only we're, not only do we just problematize practices in that way, but then we can also look at what solutions and what, what things we've always done that have worked thus far. Mm -hmm. yeah.
Thank you so much for that. I think that was a, uh, a really critical point. Um, so I think I'm going to uh, ask the, the advocacy question at this point. So what is the role of advocacy in addressing anti-Black racism inside the youth work sector and in our communities as a whole? Yeah. Um, so just kind of um, reflecting some of my earlier um, child and youth work days as a student and as a practitioner, um, it's hard. It's, it's very, very, very difficult work, especially in the front lines, and people really often don't understand when they're not in the front lines, and advocacy is one of the most powerful tools I think we have, but yet it's often one of the most difficult tools to actually use, especially when you're working in an institution or system to that, to that regard that may not be supportive of that advocacy, right, of, of, of actually empowering and amplifying that youth voice. And, I, and I've sat there and I've almost been kind of, I was never forced, but I was almost in a position where I felt stuck and I wasn't able to advocate for a young person to the best of my ability because I didn't want my manager to, to potentially fire me. I didn't want all the staff members to say I didn't have their back. I didn't want the staff to kind of gather around in the, in the, in the shift change room and, and talk about me behind my back. And it hurts, right? Not only for myself, but then to go home and have to reflect on what that young person might have been feeling within that moment. So I feel advocacy, especially in the role of anti-Black racism, needs to be done at various levels. One being the management level, right? We have to allow for room for our, our frontline practitioners to, to, to bring forth conversations and, and challenges to the institution that we surround and work with, right? If, if, our, if our practitioners who are working every day alongside these young people feel there's injustices being done but can't speak to it because they're, they're worried they can't, they're gonna get fired and they can't pay their bills to support their own family, there's an issue, right? And if us as practitioners have a blind eye towards what something our colleagues are doing and we're, we're then perpetuating these injustices. So advocacy within ourselves and in the institution needs to be placed at a higher priority where we feel safe and have a culture of, of, of allowing for a voice. And not only from the, the practitioners and the management, but the young people, not taking what they're saying so lightly. Because oftentimes we hear a young person voice their concerns like, yeah, but they're a kid, <laughs> right? What, what, what do kids really know, right? They're, they're, they're kids. When in actuality, a lot of the <laughs> most influence comes from the young people. So we have to be mindful of that contradiction. So I would just say advocacy needs to be embedded not only through our daily practice, but within the culture of institutions and systems. Yeah, I think... You know, when you speak about people feeling limited in their ability to advocate as frontline workers within the system, we can also take that up to a higher level where organizations have been consistently for over a generation depoliticized in Canada, right? Our, our nonprofit sector has shifted from where it was, say, in the, in, in the 70s and even into the 80s and with some groups today where these were membership based volunteer structures where when funding was given by government, it was core funding and nonprofits saw themselves as having a critical voice in advocating. We've moved towards nonprofits primarily becoming government subcontractors. And that voice and that ability, that space to take stances, especially to take critical or radical stances has been slowly and slowly taken away. And so it becomes very hard, right? We all know about what happens when you bite the hand that feeds you. And many organizations feel that they're in that place, that we might see an issue with this funding. We might see an issue with how this structure goes. We might see an in issue with this ministry or whatever it is. But we stay silent because we realize to speak out, to be seen as the rabble rousers or whatever it is, means our next grant may not get funded. Mm. And then we're having to let go staff. People can't feed their families. Our organization dwindles. We're marginalized as a group. And so that is the real struggle, I think, for many of our agencies. And how can we find a voice and navigate this system that is so program-based and so deliverable-based and leaves very little role for that voice? Um, but I think we have to do it. And we also have to understand that advocacy comes in different ways, right? That there's a real role for the radicals who will get in the streets, who will make demands that may seem impossible today, will just kick doors in and physically do what's necessary to be heard. But there's also a role for those folks who are gonna go and meet with the politicians and are gonna work on policy behind closed doors, who might look for compromise, who might seek allies. And there's not one way to be revolutionary or one way to be progressive. And actually we need to see that the different ways in which black folks advocate for our issues can be complementary to each other. 
But I think we as a community, as has always historically been, and especially in progressive circles, sometimes we spend so much time arguing with each other or critiquing each other's approaches because they're not pure enough. Mm. We miss the point that actually a variety of voices and a variety of advocacy tactics actually help move things forward. And we look at historical struggles, whether it was South African liberation or in the civil rights movement, there were a variety of voices. There was a variety of approaches. And it was that mix. And when people could coordinate and respect the different spaces people were advocating from, that you thought saw things really pushing forward. I don't even know if I have any more to add to that, but um, I echo everything that both um, Trayvon and Kofi has said. And um, I just really want to highlight that the piece that Kofi mentioned about, you know, the divisiveness sometimes amongst each other because we can't agree or critique each other's way of, adv of doing advocacy. And as he says, advocacy can be done in so many different ways. There's those of us who are the silent, you know, we do it silently. Um, we're, we're behind closed doors. We're making those phone calls. We're writing those letters. You know, you know, we're going out there with a young person to meet with a teacher or, or meet with a school administrator. And and so, you know, it's it's coming together and just meshing all those different styles of doing advocacy that's going to be important to our young people and also really teaching our young people how to advocate for themselves as well and 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 forming alliances and having allies. I think all too often. You know, sometimes we don't let young people know that sometimes you can you can advocate um, on your own behalf. But yes, you're going to need that support. And I, I will be that person behind you. But sometimes you have to be the face of the advocacy um, for yourself. And there's nothing and there's nothing wrong with that. Thank you. So I think some some of the, the points that are the. I mean, all of the points you've made are brilliant. Um, I think what's really important to remember is there are no perfect advocates or activists. Um, that building perfect advocates or activists is often quite exclusionary, quite classist, um, quite centered in a lot of academic discourse that those of us with a lot of expertise, knowledge, and real survival toolkits don't have access to. So making sure that that's something that is at the forefront of our mind um, that, and that we do the work everywhere, inside the system, outside the system, all around it, that even the work that happens inside the system that, you know, someone who's like me, that often people think I'm, I'm a bit further in the quote unquote radical place, whatever that means, is that I'm not necessarily working inside institutions in that capacity, but I see the value in it. That's the work of equity. That's the work of harm reduction. I see how it contributes to our communities surviving and that there's everybody's capacities, skills, and resources are directed in whatever place they can make the most impact. So there's all sorts of ways to do the work. And then also the fact that advocacy, you have to build advocacy into the culture of your organization or your space so that people don't feel loyal to your organization and not the communities you serve, that people are not advocating for your institution and not for the youth that are supposed to be benefiting from it. So there's been, there was a, a, an audience or a participant question at this point. Um, so the question is, what do we need to do to give kids uh, and frontline, frontline workers a voice, but what do you think specifically needs to happen to foster a sense of safety for young people or youth to have their voice heard and their experiences validated? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> so um, that's a very multi-layered question. So I'm just gonna try to take it piece by piece. So um, I think the first step is the awareness, right? Having an awareness of 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 your surroundings, the consciousness of the institution and policies and dynamic in your set organization. And then the second piece is dialogue, right? Because nothing can move forward without addressing it, right? And, that, and that's typically done through the initial dialogue of having a conversation with a young person and the managerial staff and kind of the governing people at the top in one room, right? Kind of calling the, pointing out the pink elephant in the room, right? I think it's also important that we, we allow innovation and advocacy to be innovative within our institutions, right? So for example, um, I had some young people that were really on Twitter and Facebook and a lot of the other staff didn't really see purpose in allowing them to express themselves through these mediums. When I started to do my research this year and I found out great movements like Black Lives Matter hashtag actually started through Twitter, right? So there's a lot of room for what they call slacktivism and these innovative ways of allowing young people to express themselves, right? Um, can I, can I, the question was very multifaceted. I think my point is to allow for that conversation, right? Kind of address that issue of lack of safety, 
within an organization and also keep in mind the innovation of advocacy and how that looks through different lenses and perspectives, whether that be young person, your perspective, kind of cliche way of how it's been done in the past. I think two things. One is that when it comes to safety as an organization, you have to provide different means for people to advocate and bring complaints forward, including anonymous ones that protect the identities of young people, but allow them to say, something's not right with that youth worker. Yeah. And we're seeing things that, you know, just don't add up. But for a young person to feel that they can safely say that and bring that complaint forward, you've got to have systems that welcome that and that protect them. You know, it's just like a whistleblower anywhere else, but especially with a young person where if they speak out and they see things that aren't going the way they are, the way an organization or staff can put pressure on them. And so you have to protect those people that have the bravery and courage to speak out. And if you have that kind of culture, then it will encourage others. The other piece is that, you know, and this was my favorite class when I went to the University of Toronto, we took a class about advocacy and learning that advocacy is actually a skill and something that can be taught and learned and built on and practiced like other skills. And that we take for granted the class-based approach, that one of the key parts of middle-class identity is understanding how these mainstream systems work and understanding how to weave and bob and get things and call Joe and then you go here and how to write the letter in the right way and to whom it may concern and all these pieces to get the resources from the system. And sometimes that experience of marginality or poverty means there isn't that same familiarity with how to get these systems to give you the goods. And I, I, that's one of the things I've learned and what we try to do in our programming is show people some of those secrets, some of those tips that they may not have gotten from their family, from their parents, about how you work these systems. And, and also that entitlement that comes as a middle class person to go to their school and say, no, what has happened in the classroom is wrong or the way you're trying to stream my child is wrong and I'm not going to have it and I'm going to call the superintendent or the school board trustee. Many times if you haven't had that experience in a middle class environment, you don't have that courage or even know that you have a right to demand that. And so I think what we do in supporting you is to help teach these tricks if we know them ourselves or to continue to educate ourselves about ways to effectively advocate and give those tools to the young people. Gillette, thank you so much, Kofi. <laughs> I know. Um, after Kofi talked, there's not much to say, right? Because Kofi, you got it. Um, no, it's true. I, I, and there is this sense of entitlement for those of us who are from the middle class, because you, know, you can pick up the phone and call this person that leads you to another person, to another person, to, 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 to be able to maneuver the system and get the results that you want. I remember a few weeks ago, I got a phone call from a colleague who's doing some work um, in the TDSB. And um, a mother was going to meet, um, I guess, with a superintendent at one of the boards and um, was basically asking me, so who do we know that could accompany this person? Because this was something that she had never done before. And just ensuring that when she goes in there that she's able to present well and just understanding the system and just understanding languages to use and how to speak and not to be seen as the angry black women, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, just having that conversation with her even though we couldn't find somebody to accompany her, but just really prepping her to go into that meeting that she could get the results that she wanted for her child. So Kofi is definitely right when he says that a lot of, a lot of, our, our, of our families um, that are living in poverty and don't have access to, do, to these systems or to persons who can advocate on their behalf or accompany them to do the advocacy, that we really do need to teach them the skill to be able to go in and do some of this work on their own. But, you know, always ensuring that we can always provide them with some type of support because maneuvering these large systems is very intimidating. It's very scary. And if you don't have the right words or the right actions, you know, people can just excuse you and just kind of overlook you. And so I really believe that teaching advocacy skills to our young people from a very early age is really important. Mm -hmm. I think there is um, in terms of. This, this is a point that everybody touched upon, uh, which is the fact that what's the culture of your organization, right? Is mm -hmm. there a criminalization of dissent? Do you mm -hmm. reward young people and, and um, colleagues and team members, people who work in and staff for falling in line and kind of echoing the, the whatever the company line is in whatever, in whatever place? Do you invite critique? Or are you always reactionary to it? Um, I think that's the safe channels piece that Kofi is talking about. Is there, you don't have, you can invite critique. 
you can absolutely in invite it and have a way to engage with it and have a process around it. It doesn't have to throw us off and we don't have to take it personally. So many people, I see that when they, there's that position of advocacy or when young people are saying this is not okay, are, are offended by it on a personal level. And I'm like, okay, your feelings are really not what's important in this situation right about now, right? Like somebody's telling you about something really oppressive happening inside your space. That, so that to me is really, that's a, a critical piece to talk about. And then also how we dismiss the advocacy and the, the critique of certain individuals based on their social location and their identity. That was the, some of the piece around being the angry black woman that Juliette brought, brought up is that like, are we dismissing young people as, oh, you know, they're young and unwise and they don't know any better. Whereas, you know, they actually live a particular life every day and that life has informed their worldview and has given them and sensitized them to experiences that some of us may not be aware of. Um, and another part of it is apologize when you're wrong, fam. Okay, this is really, I really, I cannot like stress this enough, right? Is that this is so critical is that people ter are terrible at apologizing both interpersonally and institutionally um, and encourage that in your staff. Right. If we're wrong, can you own it? I'm going to walk you through through. This is a whole workshop that I teach actually called the anatomy of an apology because I realize people are shit at apologizing. So here is the recipe or the anatomy of an apology. First, acknowledgement. This is the bearing witness piece. I acknowledge that the following has actually happened. We gaslight people who are marginalized so frequently into thinking their experiences didn't happen or that they're not the way that they perceive them. Second, emotional uptake. Emotional uptake is the opposite of emotional dismissal. Your feelings are valid. You're entitled to feel the emotion that you feel for the intensity that you feel it at the, for the duration of time that you feel it. Not, oh, I think you're overreacting. Don't you think you're being sensitive? If I were you, I'd be more upset than anything. I don't think it's that offensive, okay? Third is accountability, owning our actions in it and not providing like 5,000 pieces of actually irrelevant context. I was having a bad day and my cat is sick and like we just have a lot of like we're understaffed under when we say that we, it means you're not a priority right so being really conscious and just like owning it the accountability piece next change behavior an apology does not mean shit without change behavior where institutions and individuals are apologizing for the same behavior over and over again it starts to get offensive <laughs> it's like obviously you think i'm a fool because you're not sorry because you're still doing what you said you wouldn't be doing Okay, and then center the hurt. This is the piece around not taking it personally, right? Is It's not about you and your feelings of guilt and your feelings of being offended or, or funnily enough, your feelings of being labeled. That to me, the irony is always like tragic in, that, in, in those in, in instances. Oh, I just feel like I'm being labeled as a bad person. I'm like, you don't wanna be labeled to the people you were racist to? Like, do you, do you not see how this is like really strange? And then lastly, divest from forgiveness, okay? You, communities and individuals, do not owe you forgiveness, don't owe you rewards for doing the labor of apologizing and being accountable and transparent. Um, and then lastly, it, it, at the end of the day, when you divest from forgiveness, you do the work because it's important and you do the work for the sake of the work itself, not because you need to be given, like be freed of your guilt in whatever capacity. And that's, I think we can practice in our personal lives, but also institutionally. There was a, a a question, actually, you know what I'm gonna do? I think I'm gonna go to our strategy question. Um, and then I'm going, because some of the questions that are coming in right now are, I think are relevant to that. And then I'll prod us in that direction if they're not being answered directly. So at, at this point, we're, I'm gonna ask you, uh, what are some action items, best practices or strategies for meaningfully increasing Oh my God, I can't even speak words for meaningfully addressing anti-black racism in designing and implementing youth programming. So, I think it's perfect. Oh. Go ahead, Kofi. Okay, thank you. Um, so there's a couple of places I think we can think about. I think it starts with staffing for me. The design can be great, but I've seen designs for youth programs that are not so hot, but they have good staff who can build relationships and they make it work. They create those environments that move forward. So a lot of it, if you are in a management or leadership role, is who you hire. And never rushing a hire because we had to start the program this month. Go back to that funder and say you need two more months if you do not have the staff who has the cultural competency to deliver it for the young people you're serving. Otherwise, the entire thing is going to be uphill from then on. Um, I think I 
part of that staffing is about relationships, especially with highly marginalized youth. You need folks who can build relationships and a focus on taking the time and doing activities that build those relationships into the design. So one of the things we did at C is every program we do starts with a three-day retreat outside of the city. And people will, will resist it and young people will say, no, but I've got things to do or this or that. But it is so important to our design that we spend time to say, we're not just going in another program. You're not just stepping in another space. We're actually trying to build a community of uh, dedicated black professionals and young people who are also professionals who are all trying to move together. So take that time. I think we have to talk programs for black peoples around healing and trauma and space to acknowledge the traumas, the traumas from the educational system, the traumas from policing, the traumas from just being black in this world and give places for healing. It can't just be on content, content, content. We sometimes have to give the room for spaces to heal. Um, and then I think, the, you know, it's talking about identity, really having spaces where we can talk about identity in an honest place, but not in an abstract place. And sometimes that needs role models, people that people can look up to and say, OK, you know, especially for our young men, I see how you are living out this idea of being, you know, a strong black man who's also a caring and compassionate father or also a loving partner or also someone who has strong black male identity, but is queer. You know, all these different uh, things that we have to model. One of the best ways to do it is by bringing in folks who can show it and allow people to see outside of what they may have seen in their own life experiences or their neighborhoods. And so exposure is another piece for programming for our youth, taking them out of places. They're tired of sitting in a gym and getting a can of pop and a bag of chips and just some chart paper on the wall. You know, for us, we say the whole city is our classroom and part of education in an experiential way is taking people out of their community and into different spaces and showing this entire nation is yours. It should be seen as a place that you have ownership and rights to, and you should feel that connection, but you may not have because of the experiences you've had up until this point. So let's allow the programming to be part of that uh, process of reclaiming you know, the ownership of this space that you're in. Thank I think you. what I wanted to add is um, involvement of young people in the framing of the program that they're going to participate in. I think all too often a group of us sit at the table and like, oh yeah, let's do this program and young people are going to come out to it. But at no point did we have several young people sitting at that table to say, yeah, that's a good idea. No, I'm not going to come. No, my friends are not going to come. So I think it's really important for young people to be there to frame the program, what it's going to look like, what the outcomes are, what are their inputs, um, employing some of them to, 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 to work in that program so that they're getting something out of it as well. I think that's really key. I think something that we also need to do, and I, I, I know people have kind of stepped away from it. I remember when I was programming, is having parental involvement. We always plan programs for our young people like they're standalone. Young people are attached to families. They're attached to parents. It's very important that parents know where their young people are going, the type of programming that they're involved in, having some input, um, seeing what their young people are investing their time in and what they're getting out of it as well. So I think for me, those are two key things that when you're doing programming that you need to really consider and we need to really get back to when we're working with our young people. Thank you. Trevon? Where do I even add at this point? Um... I think for me, just kind of adding on to what both Juliet and Kofi mentioned was um, agency collaboration. So oftentimes when we have an agency or an organization, we may be stuck, right? We may think this is the best that we can do and we may be kind of caught up in our own program and processes that can use some other collaboration, right? Collaboration is a beautiful thing, right? That's, that's how society works. That's how my discipline works, right? It's never just child and youth work. It's all interdisciplinary. We have social workers, we have doctors. It's really about grabbing on everyone and anyone's expertise to add to a common goal, right? So even maybe connecting with an organization like Youth Rex that might pr 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 provide you with um, intentional programming, best practices, evidence to support what you're doing, webinars that kind of talk about these complex issues that seem to be a personal but very connect to a political and bigger issue. So allowing for that educational piece to kind of seek more than what we know, constantly being hungry to do better and improve programming for young people. Yeah, you were speaking earlier, uh, Trevon, before we got into the webinar about jargonisms and labels, and then we got yes. we got a question about that actually from from the audience. And I feel like you should speak to that a little bit if you're comfortable. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, um, jargons, right? Um, oftentimes we speak and communicate in ways that 
may seem just natural and, and, and really unoffensive, but in actuality, these, these words, lingu- ling- linguistics of things, it's, it's, it's very critical, right? And when we say things like at-risk youth, right, we're, we're now labeling the young person before even putting them before their exceptionalities or their adversities, right? So being mindful of the impact of language and having a strength-based lens whenever we frame things, right? We have, when we're working with a young person that might be diagnosed with exceptionalities, being mindful of not saying things that make, make them feel lower or lesser than, right? Being aware of these unique and things that we all go through and not framing them in deficit-based ma- manners, right? Pathological ways is being strength-based and saying that you are resilient in, in who you are, right? And allowing the language, right? When we speak, there's power behind that, right? So when we're speaking to these young people, the, these, these young fragile minds, we need to be mindful that every word we use in our intervention needs to have intentionality and intentions behind them. So it's not of excuse for a practitioner not to know. We have to do our due diligence and being aware and conscious of everything we do when working with young people who face adversities. Thank you so much for that. I think um, myself, I remember, you know, I'm, I'm older now, but I remember being a youth and I remember, you know, um, youth workers and organizations and institutions coming into my neighborhood and calling us troubled. And I was like, actually, the trouble is with y'all. <laughs> like, really, really and truly, I'm just here living my life, right? And that was I, something that is, I think we, it's either that or we just like attach this label of resilience onto black kids and we just don't really understand the harm in like either or can we be allowed contradiction and nuance and complication can we have challenges and barriers that don't when we call someone at risk or trouble we say that the problem is with them Um, yeah okay the problem is not with us the problem is with the barriers and the systems that prevent us from navigating our lives in ways that in which we can do more than just survive right so for me, I, I, something that's really critical to me is confronting the, the narrative of resilience. The narrative of resilience for me can be really, really harmful. I, I get that all the time. Oh, Ronnie, you're so strong. You're so resilient. I was like, resilience is a trait that is earned through trial by fire. It is not a choice. Okay, resilience is an armor that made up of a thousand and one scars. Resilience is not a choice for black children. What choice do we have? Be resilient or lay down and die. That's it, right? There's no... So celebrating that, you know, is really, to me, is a part of that, you know, trauma tourism that we do with young Black people of, like, walk me through all your horrible experiences so I can develop some sense of empathy for you and then applaud you for having survived that. Um, we don't actually have a choice but to survive. Uh, and resilience <laughs> is means you can take it. Right. Mm-hmm. We use resilience to justify a lot of things that happen to young black people. And at the end of the day, like, I don't want to be resilient. I've said it before and I'll say it again. I'd like to be soft and fucked up because that's what's happened. That's that's the world around me. And that's the impact that it's land that has landed on me as a result of it. And then when we talk about resilience, we don't tend to leave a lot of room for conversations around the mental health of young black people. Um, and then we get asked questions that somebody asked in the last uh, webinar and that uh, Cyril problematized really well, which was why do we think that young black people are in who experience racism have mental health issues as a result of it? And definitely, I mean, do you think humans who are consistently being dehumanized will have a mental health response to that? Absolutely. And I think when, when we frame it in particular ways, it says to us that we actually think that pe- black people are not human in a full capacity. So that to me is something to think about. In terms of tangible strategies, community consultation. And I'm not talking about you come into a community, you rent out the gymnasium in the local community center, you host some consultations with some Timbits, and then you um, do whatever you want at the end of the day. When we consult with communities, we need to set goals in conjunction with those communities, measurable goals, and involve communities in, in the evaluation process as well. At the end of the day, when you're going to take my stories, my lived experience, I need to know what you're going to do with it. I need to know that you're going to honor it. Um, There's so many examples of black communities being quote unquote consulted when it comes to redevelopment of our neighborhoods, programming, youth programming, education, and then none of that actually going to inform the actual design of it. And then I'll talk about something that's meaningful inclusion. Okay, Meaningful inclusion is, in terms of my practice, is more than a seat at the table. Okay, I don't want you to invite me to your dinner party as an afterthought. I want to be part of the decision making process. I want to fold our napkins into opera houses and not swans. Everybody knows that's cuter. I want to pick our table setting 
okay? Maybe I'm gonna eat with my hands, maybe I'm a vegetarian, maybe I'm a vegan, maybe it's Ramadan and I'm fasting, maybe I only eat halal or kosher, maybe I'm allergic to something, maybe I have health issues and dietary restrictions, maybe your table is too high for my friend in a mobility device. When we, there, there are more people who are in the margins involved in the decision-making capacity, those pro, the design of the programming will fit us in ways and, and that will amplify the impact of that. And then also be really weary of how we use our expertise as, oh, I'm a professional in this sector to um, silence young people who are talking about their lived experience. That happens so frequently where young people, it's like you have expert power as a youth worker or as a consultant, as an academic, and then you use that expert power instead of a position of advocacy, but you use it to silence people. Um, hmm. And then thinking about holistic supports for youth. Um, so that they're not just there for the duration of your program every Thursday from six to nine, and then the rest of the week, that's it. So connecting with other organizations, uh, collaboration. There's this, uh, such a strange culture of competition in the not-for-profit not world, particularly in the youth serving sector, is that, oh, they're, I, I was consulting for an organization and they were really upset that I'd taken on a client that does similar work in another part of the city. And they said, there are direct competitors. And I said, okay, what are you selling? And they were like, oh, I'm like, yeah, they're not your competitors. There's so much work to do. I understand that we're quote unquote competing for funding, but when we collaborate, that actually helps to amplify the impact of the dollars that we, you know, we get from whatever um, space. And then also make sure their youth in your leadership, paid leadership positions in your organization, paid money talks, make sure youth can survive, get paid for their work, get paid for their labor, get valued. Cause that translates into all, throughout all our lives. Yeah, I don't know if there was anything else that I wanted to add in that. If there is, I will share um, on Twitter if people are interested in this. It's going to be an image file, and I'll share the text because it's so long. I'll share it on my Facebook page, which is or, uh, Organizational Practices for Fostering um, Anti-Oppression uh, or Anti-Oppressive Practices in Your Organization. I'll just share a list of, like, 10 practices or so. We're not going to have a mountain of time to uh, go through certain things, but I did want to to talk about, there are two questions that came in from uh, participants. The first was that, what do you think are some strategies for co for collecting accurate or participant informed data? And are there some specific questions that you find are not being asked in data collection? Hmm. Um, yeah, so this, that's a very, that's a very um, first question. Um, so when I think about evaluation, I often have to like logistically lay things out to give a correct answer around how to typically phrase a question or frame it. So when I think about data collection in terms of youth voice, I think one of the first things we need to ask is why we want to collect the voice. What outcome is this going to serve to help benefit, right? Because when we collect data, oftentimes we don't know why we want it. It just sounds like a very, very good thing to do because a lot of other people are doing it. But when we have data, we wanna make sure it's correlated to an outcome. So that way we can gauge activities, right? To make things better, enhance our programming to then mitigate a disparity or an impact. So I think when we're thinking about framing these questions, we also need to think in a bigger context, why? What outcome do we wanna kind of fix? What do we wanna do better for these young people? And then definitely allow them to kind of speak free flowingly in a safe room. So be mindful that if we have all the staff and managerial place in, 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 in the context of these questions, it may veer or shift the questions, right? Maybe allowing for a dialogue amongst young people, right? A more of a focus group style where they can collaborate and, and work alongside each other and say, hey, yeah, that was a great idea. I went through this. And then allow them to speak from that lived experience perspective versus more so of a controlled environment where it's more asking direct questions. Allow for that genuine flow of things, a very natural feel when we're asking these questions. And once again, the outcomes. Be sure to ask why we even need this data in the first place. Thank you. I think the other thing about data collection is trust and relationships, right? I think you, like anything else, you need to do multidisciplinary approaches, but if it's an evaluator that the youth don't know who's suddenly showing up midway through project or calling them on the phone, asking invasive questions, you're not gonna get good data, Yeah. right? And so it's important, even if it is a, a third party evaluator, and that person is culturally competent, 
that the first time they, you know, you see them is not when they're asking them, have you been in conflict with the law? And is this going on in your family that there's someone who's actually taken time to build some trust with the young people? And that it, there's gotta be some reciprocity, right? And we found if you want someone to come back for a focus group or to re-engage afterwards with your program, what are you offering them? And not just a gift card, but are they <laughs> going to be able to get learning or skills or is it through a social activity? And then at the end you say, hey, we just want to ask you three questions about your experience six months ago. But you've got, you know, we, we sometimes can be so extractive with the young people and they know it, right? They're not dumb. They can understand that this relationship, that you are just mining them for their valuable information. And I think sometimes it's being honest too. Like I'll go in the room if we're doing a focus group and I'll say, yo, listen, our funders need to know about this. This is how we pay the bills. I know you guys appreciate what was happening. I know that, you know, this might be going deeper than, than you may want to go and you don't have to go there, but this is why we need this information. And I think if you have a relationship of trust, you can just be real with people. You can tell them this is why we're having it. But so often data collection, it's happening and it's not even clear to young people why you're taking this data or they read between the lines. So I think openness and transparency is also a key technique to getting honest answers. And I think it's important um, making sure the evaluator is there from the onset of the program. And I think it's also having a small group of the young people work with the evaluator to frame some of those questions yeah. because they know what they will tell someone. And so if they're working with the evaluator to frame the question to get the data, I think that is so important. And that's something that, you know, I'm going to be working with a group of young people on an anti-Black racism leadership program. And I was saying, you know, I reached out to Trayvon and saying, you know, I want you to come. I want you to meet the young people. I want to know that you're an evaluator and I want, you know, they're going to be compensated. So I want a small group of them to work with him to even get the skills. So later on, whenever they're involved in any type of programming, that they understand the importance of evaluation. They understand, understand the importance of collecting data and that they learn the skills that we don't always have to go to an expert or somebody who's being paid big, big bucks to do it that we have a a, 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 a a trained group of young people who can go out from different communities and different programs and do some of this evaluation themselves and collect some of this data on behalf of an organization. Thank you uh, so much, folks. Just to kind of wrap up the, this particular question, um, just informed consent around the data collection and like really, really informed and that people don't feel, uh, that's actually important for the integrity of the data itself, right? That way people are not just answering it because they just want to get it over with. You're actually getting really genuine, genuine data. That data, again, has to be intersectional. And then when we're talking about practical solutions and strategies, often that's the question that I get so every panel, every workshop, every consultation. There is no recipe, okay? There is no one-size-fits-all solution. There is no, this is how you fix it. Okay, there's only consultation, intimate knowledge of your communities, those communities being leadership positions. There's lots of practices that we can do to best inform how to address a particular issue, barrier, or gap in services. But that all has to be rooted in that intersectional anti-oppressive practice and a commitment to Black communities and Black youth. Um, and then Black youth will participate more if they see themselves reflected. Yeah. I, I, as a speaker, I get warned sometimes when I'm going to certain spaces, particularly when I'm speaking at um, quote unquote alternative schools. Um, whenever I get invited as a speaker there, I get warned by every educator, oh, it's a tough group, it's a tough group, it's a tough group. And I get in and I'm like, yo, my name is Rania, I'm from Regent Park and everything is, all the barriers are down, right? Then I can have a real conversation. And I, and I also coming in from that place of this is a troubled group, this is an at-risk community, puts people in a place of, it's, adver it's adversarial. People are in a defensive and not receptive place, and it sets up a really harmful power dynamic. So coming in, I'm like, hi, my name is Rania. I'm also, you know, recently graduated from being an at-risk youth. Um, so being able to really bring in people that reflect their lived experiences is really critical. Um, we do not have a mountain of time left. I think we've got about two minutes and I wanna be really respectful of people's time. I know it's the middle of the workday for folks. So I will, in, I'm not gonna volunteer the other panelists to do this, but I will uh, invite you to tweet at me and if I, it's a question that I can answer. Um, I think I missed the question actually from the audience is whether this information is being in integrated into education 
from K to 12 into the school curriculum. No, it is not being integrated into the school curriculum conversations, particularly around anti-Black racism. Unfortunately, when you get these kind of provincial directives that are coming down, it takes forever for it to make its way into any particular ministry in a profound way, particularly in getting something in the curriculum in the, for the Ministry of Education in Ontario is tremendously challenging. Um, and there's also so many teachers that are reporting a lot of resistance around even talking about anti-Black racism um, and students who are talk, being policed around talking about Black experiences. And I'm, I'm hearing a lot of those stories now because it's Black History Month, you know, and I encourage everyone to remember that even though this place is taking, this event or the webinar is taking place in February, the rest of us are Black in January, February, March, April, June, July, the whole year. Um, so being conscious of how that, you know, Anti-black racism is a year-round experience, multi-seasonal, multifaceted, um, and to think about that constantly. Thank you. I'm super grateful for everyone who was able to join us here today. Thank you for your wisdom, for your expertise, for your insights. Um, I learned a lot, and um, it's always a pleasure to be around people who are brilliant like you. And um, hopefully, we will connect again soon. Thank you so much for your time and your energy. Again, connect with me on Twitter and Youthrex on Twitter if you have any questions. Thanks a million. Go enjoy this like one sunny day that we got. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Thank you. bye.